So we are very pleased to introduce uh, Rob Nowak today. Um, Rob needs no introduction, I think, to most of you, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Uh, so Rob received the BS, MS, and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from uh, Madison, where he is now um, a full professor. Um, Rob is actually now the McFarland Bascom Professor of Engineering at Wisconsin Madison. Uh, he has won too many awards to name, uh, but many of us know his seminal work in signal processing, machine learning, imaging, and network sciences. And uh, we are very excited to hear from him today on Banach's face representative theorems for neural networks. Uh, take it away, Rob. Great. Well, thank you, Vijay. Thank you, everybody, for uh, organizing this great workshop and inviting me to participate. I've enjoyed all the talks so far, and I look forward to the rest of them. And thanks to all the uh, people who are listening in today. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to let me tell you a little bit about what we've been thinking about. Uh, just one thing I wanted to clarify, uh, in case you know somebody's listening. Uh, technically, now my title is Nosbush Professor in Engineering. That the one you mentioned, Vijay, was the old one. So, okay, uh, just a shout out to that support. So, thank you. And then I wanted to, uh, I, you know, I, I always like to have a picture on my title slide. And uh, this is the coolest neural network picture that I, I've ever seen. It's the strange attractor of a simple recurrent neural network with three ReLU neurons. Uh, and you're looking at sort of the how often the phase of that system visited, visits different positions in three-dimensional space or a tractor set. My dad made this, uh, and I just thought it's super cool. And since we're talking about neural networks, I thought I would uh, put it up there as a little artwork to get our attention. All right, so let me move on then. And, uh, you know, if people have questions, I'm happy to answer them as we go or take questions at the end. And Vijay, just feel free to stop me if something comes up and we need to clarify or whatever. All right, so the perspective that I want to take today uh, is the non-parametric perspective on over-parameterization. And, and let me just explain what I mean by that. So uh, suppose we have a training data set and we have some space F, so this is a Banach space of real valued functions that map our features into labels. And suppose we look at a learning problem where we try to uh, find a function from this function space that fits our data. So that's the first term in this objective function, plus some sort of regularizer. Uh, that's the norm of the function in that space times a regularization parameter lambda. And so uh, this kind of problem, of course, has been studied for decades. And uh, this is really maybe the what I think is one of the most powerful ways to think about over-parameterization. And you might um, say, well, where are the parameters in this? And so just to kind of show you where parameters are, you could think of a situation where you have a basis for this space F, so phi k. Uh, and then any function in that space can be represented in an, an expansion in that basis. And so the coefficients of that expansion, the theta k's, are effectively the parameters. And then the norm of your function reflects the size of those parameters in some sense. And usually we can, or often we can relate the norm of the function to some sort of norm on that sequence of coefficients. And we'll see that kind of come up in some of the examples we'll look through. But that's the approach we're, and perspective we're going to take in this talk. So uh, the main kind of problem that I'm going to discuss is the, the question of what problems or what optimizations do neural networks actually solve? What are they the solution to? We, we know we can take a neural network model and train it, and it may or may not work well, uh, but are they actually the optimal solution to a particular problem? And that's what I'll be looking at. And I'm kind of dividing the talk into three parts. The first part is the simplest and the easiest to understand, the easiest also to compare with uh, other common approaches. And that's the one-dimensional and shallow neural network. Part two will be multi-dimensional and shallow. And then in part three, we'll move all the way to deep neural network architectures. And all of this is joint work with uh, Rahul Pari, who's a fantastic uh, graduate student at the University of Wisconsin with me. So the first part, one dimensional and shallow. So uh, what I wanna kind of talk about are what I think are three really remarkable ideas. 
highlights, if you will, in the history of non-parametric learning. Uh, the first is reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. These are essentially linear estimators, and they are using L2 regularization methods, and they uh, encompass familiar things like Sobolev state spaces, radial basis functions, random features models. And uh, one of the powerful things about the RKHS framework is we have this notion of a representer theorem. Basically tells us what exactly is the form of optimal solutions to some sort of variational optimization over that function space. Uh, and that's the, the, the celebrate representer theorem of RKHSs. But I want to emphasize that those methods are linear estimators, meaning they're linear in the labels. And that's uh, going to be a limitation of those methods. And I'll kind of explain how that is and what it means. The second really cool idea, and again, I should say this is kind of personal from my own perspective in history, what I learned over the course of my career, wavelets are super cool uh, in wavelet representations. And one of the things about wavelet representations is they start to uh, build up nonlinear representations. And of course, things like L1 as opposed to L2 regularization are very important wavelet methods. And so this uh, encompasses things like Sobolev spaces and a lot of things that RKHSs can do, but it also extends our range of problems that we can tackle to spaces of bound of variation, Bezoff spaces, et cetera. And the key ideas there are nonlinear approximation and wavelet thresholding. And then finally, of course, we're all interested in neural networks. These are also nonlinear. I'll show you that they also are about L1 regularization. They're also good for some of the same spaces that wavelets are good for, functions of bounded variation. There's also a representer theorem uh, that we have for neural networks that mimics or, or mirrors what you see in the RKHS setting. And then I'll talk about how gradient descent and weight decay relate to uh, variational problems over certain bounded variation function spaces. So I wanna compare those three approaches. RKHS approaches, wavelet approaches, neural network approaches. In the simplest setting, that's the one-dimensional setting, and we're gonna look just at shallow neural networks in this case as well. And to understand the differences between the sort of linear L2 approaches, the RKHS methods, and nonlinear L1 methods, like wavelet methods and neural networks, it's really kind of helpful to just look and focus at two different function spaces. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, function space H2, which consists, this is a Sobolev space, and it's defined to be functions whose second derivative, that's what that F, uh, let me see if I can get my arrow here. Where is my arrow? My arrow's not showing up, so sorry about that. F uh, with the two up there, that just means the second derivative. We're looking at the uh, integral of the second derivative squared. And if that's finite, then that function is in that Sobolev space. And then a related space is BV2. This is the space where the uh, integral, of the absolute value of the second derivative is finite. And I should just stress here that the de derivatives here are, are understood in a distributional sense so that in the case of BV, we can also include uh, things whose second derivatives are like Dirac impulses. So these spaces kind of nest as you see there. The Sobolev space is inside the bound of variation space, which of course, both of which are in L2. So those two spaces really kind of help us distinguish between linear and nonlinear methods. And I'll kind of walk you through that in this first part of the talk. But I just wanna show as an example, here's a function that uh, is in BV2, but not in the Sobolev space. So this is a function that's very smooth almost everywhere, except at those corners where this triangular waveform turns direction. And it, there, of course, the, the second derivative blows up. It becomes like a Dirac delta. And this type of function is in BV2, but not in the Sobolev space. So that's an example of something that's uh, a simple function that can't be represented in a Sobolev space. So here's a long story short. And I, again, I'll explain this so that it's hopefully clear. All three methods, kernels, wavelets, and neural networks are optimal for learning in Sobolev spaces but kernel methods are suboptimal for this BV2 space, which is important. And I'll explain why that, that, that lack of performance of kernel methods, uh, linear estimators in BV2 is, is a real serious shortcoming. So let's start off by thinking about learning in the Sobolev space. 
So um, the solution to this variational problem, and here I'm writing it in terms of minimizing the squared errors of your fit to the data. That's the first term. The second term is, is this term we saw in the definition of the sublevel space, the uh, integral of the second derivative squared. The solution to this is a cubic smoothing spline. That's the classic celebrated work of Kimmeldorf and Waba. And that means that we can write the solution, the function f, as just a linear combination of kernel functions evaluated at the data points. And so the only thing we have to learn here are these weights or parameters, the alphas, and they're just the solution to that simple uh, quadratic function minimization. And as we know, minimizing a quadratic function uh, leads to a solution that's linear in the data or linear in Y, the labels that we get, okay? So this is uh, the, the, the RKHS setting. And one of the things we know is if we have data, if our YJs are coming from some true underlying function F star, maybe plus a little bit of noise, and this, if this F star function is in that sobel F space, then we know that this smoothing spline enjoys really good performance as a function of the number of training examples n, the mean square error of f hat from f star decays like n to the minus four fifths. So it's gone down very rapidly, even though we're operating this function space. Uh, Rob, sorry yeah, to go interrupt. Ahead. Yeah. Um, I think there's just a request. If you could oh. uh, minimize the build order um, window on your presentation, I think oh, it's blocking gosh. some of the slides. I don't know. Oh, sorry. I didn't even notice that there. That's thank you for letting me know. Let's see. Is it tell me if it's gone now? It's gone now. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, no, no. Thanks for letting me know. Okay. I so I, I talked about how we could, you know, where are the parameters? Well, here's here are the parameters in the Sobolev setting. We can uh, represent any function in the Sobolev space in terms of its Fourier series. And in particular, what it means to be in the Sobolev space is that the Fourier series coefficients have to decay pretty rapidly. And specifically, they have to satisfy that condition you see over there in the upper right, namely that the sum of k to the fourth theta k squared needs to be summable. So that's telling you that the Fourier series coefficients have to roll off pretty quickly to be in a Sobolev space. These have to be smooth functions. And so we can also express the smoothing spline in terms of its Fourier series. I'm not going to do that, but another estimator that performs almost you know, as well and as well in theory is just a truncated Fourier series. So the idea is that you write out your, uh, your function in terms of the empirical Fourier series coefficients, which you compute from the data, those are the theta hats there, and then you just kill off the tail of that Fourier series, that's truncation. And if you truncate at a level that's on the order of n to the minus, or n to the one fourth rather, then the, this truncated Fourier series estimate, or maybe the simplest thing you could think of, also has this really nice uh, rate of convergence n to the minus four fifths. So kernel methods, Fourier series methods, linear estimators, because again, if you just look at the form of this F tilde, it's very clear that it's linear in the data. The coefficients theta hat are just linear functions of the labels that we uh, observe in our training set. So, um, what are, what's the limitation of this approach and RKHS approaches in general, Hilbert space approaches in general? Well, you can see it by looking at a, uh, a function that's going to be a little bit tricky and difficult for an RKHS method to handle. And it's a function where there's spatially varying smoothness. So this function, which is the sort of blue uh, uh, line triangular like waveform that I sh I'm showing here, there, um, you can see it's very kind of slowly varying. Uh, at the beginning, then it oscillates very rapidly, then it's slow again later. And the red dots are some uh, example or some, some samples from that function plus a little bit of noise. So if we uh, solve for our optimal smoothing spline in this case, here are a couple of different solutions with different values of lambda, a large value of lambda and a smaller value of lambda. And the, the issue is that we, we really have to choose. Either the smoothing spline is gonna over smooth in the high variation portion of the data. So we just kind of lose all that there, or it's going to under smooth in the low variation portion of the data, basically overfit to those data. And uh, there's just no way to kind of handle this spatially varying uh, smoothness in the function with a kernel method. And so kernel methods cannot adapt to local smoothness in the function or data. And that's, 
that's one of the big limitations and, and this will be a reoccurring kind of theme in, in this talk. So now let's turn to learning in this space of bounded variation, BV2. So again, the definition of that space involves uh, assuming that the integral of the absolute value of the second derivative uh, is finite. And so you could consider the variational uh, optimization fit your data subject to minimizing that almost like L1 norm of that second derivative. This also has a solution, which is a spline, but it's not a cubic smoothing spline. It turns out that it's what's known as a locally adaptive regression sp spline. And that looks like this. It has a linear portion, the first part of this function, alpha zero plus alpha one times X. And then it has uh, uh, this, these other terms, which are essentially just rectified linear unit terms uh, where the biases are exactly at the training data points, these xj's, okay? So here, all you have to do again is solve for these coefficients, the alphas, but what's crucial is that the solution is not solving an L2 regularization. Instead, it's finding the coefficients, the alpha j's that minimize an L1 norm. And so uh, that sort of distinguishes this uh, a lot from what's going on in the RKHS setting. The solution now will be nonlinear in the data. And what you can show again is if your data generating function is in this BV2 space, then uh, your estimator based on this locally adaptive regression spline has the same rate of convergence, n to the minus one, four fifths, uh, even though it's operating in this much bigger space, bigger than the Sobolev space. So what's another approach to dealing with BV2? Well, you could look at the series approach. So here we would wanna use a wavelet series. I'm just showing a wavelet function there, WC4 wavelet. And uh, what we can do is rather than just simply truncating a wavelet series, what we're going to do is let F sub M denote the wavelet series approximation using the M terms with the largest coefficients in that series. So this is what's called the nonlinear M term approximation because you're actually selecting which wavelet functions from all that, that you want to use to build up your function. And if you do this, and if you have a function in BV2, then uh, the M term approximation decays very quickly, like M to the minus one fourth. And so now, again, if, the, if we're using this in an estimation scheme, what we're going to do is look at the empirical wavelet coefficients, which we compute from our data. Then we're going to threshold those. So that's called wavelet thresholding. It's a nonlinear estimator that gives us the same rate of convergence as the locally adaptive regression spline. So here, here's just a kind of picture of how locally adaptive regression splines and wavelet denoising or thresholding methods can be adaptive to uh, the spatial, spatially varying smoothness. You see here that where both methods are, are not really overfitting in the slowly varying portions, while at the same time, they're able to quickly adjust and track the data in that more uh, rapidly varying portion of the function. Uh, Rob, there was one yeah. question in the Q&A from uh, Karthik Srinivasan, uh, mm -hmm. which is, it actually goes a couple of slides back. It's, the question oh, okay. is, is the condition on the finite sum of K4 theta squared related to the condition in Baden's approximation theorem? Yeah, this is the it looks like it's the square summable condition on the first math line of your slide. Yeah, is it related to what? Sorry, the condition it? is it related to the condition in Baden's approximation theorem? Um, in Baron's, is that that, that what yeah. you said? Yeah. Um, I I I think this is a little different than uh, those barren spaces. Um, where the k to the fourth comes up is if you differentiate twice, uh, you're 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 going to end up like with uh, you know uh, an omega squared coming out or whatever. If you think about your Fourier series coefficient, so it's really just coming out from the differentiation thing. So um, these are. I don't know how related they are to barren type spaces. I don't, I don't, I think that's a different kind of approach. So let me move forward again. Thank you. So we Thank saw you. the limit, yeah, sure. Was there something else? No? No. So this is showing, again, this is maybe a good thing. Now we can see like we really couldn't strike a balance. We either had to be over smoothing or under smoothing. 
Whereas if we use these wavelet or uh, wavelet methods or the locally adaptive regression splines, we, we, we get the best of both. We can accommodate the spatially varying smoothness. So um, now let's talk about neural networks. So here's the form of a single hidden layer neural network, I guess with a skip connection added. That's the, the linear uh, terms in the front of this, V0 plus V1 times X. And this looks very much like the same form as the locally adaptive regression spline. In fact, it is, except in the locally re adaptive regression spline, we fix the knots BJ to be at the data points. Um, but but it, otherwise, it's, it's exactly equivalent in, in functional form. And if we train a neural network, right, what, what's one thing we might do is we might use squared error loss. So that's what I'm showing you here. And then if we're going to regularize it, oh, the most common choice would be to just use weight decay. And that's what I'm showing you there. So the input and output layer weights, Bs and Ws, are just uh, using this ridge regularization type term. So uh, it turns out that if you solve that neural network training with weight decay, the solution is equivalent to the locally adaptive regression spline. And to see that, it's not too difficult. Here's again what training with weight decay is basically the objective that it's working with. And now if you think about it, if you had any positive constant C, because of the uh, piecewise linearity of the ReLU function, you could take the input and output weights, Vj and Wj, for any neuron, divide Vj by C and scale up Wj by C, and that won't affect the overall function at all, right? Because I'm just moving the, the constant, positive constant C inside and outside of that ReLU function, so it doesn't change anything. And what this means, if you think about it for a second, is that I could rescale V and W however I like, as long as I'm dividing, you know, scaling them uh, in that fashion, and so that sum of squared terms that you see in the regularizer actually wants to be balanced. And what it means to be balanced is that at the solution to this optimization, you'll have the magnitude of Vj equal to the magnitude of Wj. And this is something that was first uh, popularized in, in the work of Nishabar and others. So uh, that means that weight decay is a equivalent to path norm optimization. And then if you make the connection with the locally adaptive regression spline, you can easily see that training a neural network with squared error loss and weight decay is exactly the same as this uh, uh, previously known locally adaptive regression spline idea. So uh, here I just wanted to show you, in case you're doubting me that that training a neural network with weight decay is a an L1 optimization at the end of the day. Here's a, a little problem where I had just a, a simple set of data where I have it. The data points are at one level, then they're at another level and they pop up again. That black uh, line you see in the trained uh, network at the upper left is the learned function. The neural network that's learned turns out to be quite sparse. In this case, there were 10 times more weights uh, both in the input and output layer than training examples. Uh, but the number of non-zero weights or, or non-trivial weights is more like proportional to n, the number of data in this case. So you definitely will, if you fully train a neural network with weight decay, you will definitely end up sparsifying your weights. So, uh, just to kind of make this connection, neural networks and wavelet thresholding, both of these approaches can be viewed as selecting the best M terms from a dictionary of atoms. In the case of wavelets, the dictionaries are just the wavelet basis functions. And training, in this case, just means thresholding the empirical wavelet coefficients. In the case of neural networks, the dictionary are these ReLU atoms, right? So they just look like uh, uh, neurons that are indexed by the weight W and the bias B. This is a continuous uncountable dictionary that we're effectively working over. Uh, and the training method is SGD plus weight decay. And they both give us sparse solutions. So here again, is kind of everything all together, showing that, that tar true function in data, the wavelet denoising, the neural network, and then the problems with the smoothing splines. So um, that's sort of the end of part one. 
So the main point of part one is that there is a big difference between kernel methods or any linear estimators and what you can do with neural networks. And neural networks have these connections to other things that are very well understood, at least in low dimensional settings. So now we're gonna to move to the multidimensional and shallow setting. And just to get a little notation here uh, throughout the rest of the talk here, I'm going to denote the ReLU activation function by this uh, phi. And then uh, it's going to be important just in some of what we discussed to distinguish between linear summing nodes and uh, nodes that have ReLU act activation. So linear summing is going to be gray. ReLU will be this kind of orange color. Okay, so I want to kind of go back to this idea of representer theorems. So uh, this is what a representer theorem is. It tells us that solutions to certain learning problems in infinite dimensional function spaces can be expressed in terms of finite dimensional par parameterized functions. And this goes back to the, again, the work of Kimmeldorf and Waba. And here's what the RKHS representer theorem uh, looks like. It says that if you have a reproducing kernel Hilbert space F that has a kernel K, then for any training set and any lower semi-continuous loss function, the solution of this variational problem, which is minimize some data fitting term plus a regularizer, which was related to the norm of the function F in this RKHS, uh, then the solution to this has a representation, which is just a linear combination of the kernel function evaluated at the training points. And again, you can solve for these alphas. It's just a very simple optimization problem you end up solving a system of linear equations. And so those alphas are linear in the Ys in your training set. So is there a neural network representer theorem? It turns out there is, but not in Hilbert space. And we should already kind of think about that because we were talking about that BV2 space before, which is not a Hilbert space. So here's a neural network representer theorem. I'm gonna kind of go through this in a little bit more detail, but I just wanna kind of put it up to parallel what you saw for the RKHS. There's a Banach space F, which has some norm, which I'll tell you about. It's one of these bounded variation norms, such that for any training set and any semi lower semi-continuous loss function, you do the same thing. You minimize data fitting plus the norm of the function in this Banach space. Then it has a solution uh, in the form of a single hidden layer ReLU neural network. So it says that single hidden layer rectified linear unit neural networks are the optimal solution to certain variational problems. And what I mean by k less than or equal to n, it means that you can actually find a relatively sparse one. The number of neurons that you need doesn't need to be bigger than n, the number of training examples. So how, how, how do we kind of approach this? Uh, we, there's been a lot of progress over the past, say, decade or so on learning over infinite dictionaries of atoms. And I've already suggested to you this idea that that's what's really going on with a shallow neural network. It's like learning over a continuous dictionary of atoms where the dictionary consists of these neurons. And so other examples of this include off-the-grid compressed sensing, generalized splines, and total variation seminorm types of optimizations. And there's this really nice paper that I'm kind of highlighting here that kind of goes into this very general setting of minimizing data fit plus a regularizer in uh, a, a very bounded variation type spaces. And this quote is kind of nice. It says, in the infinite dimensional setting, when the domain X is usually a Bonnock space, there's been clear evidence that the action of regularizers is promoting different notions of sparsity, but there has not been a comprehensive theory explaining this effect. And this paper that I have here goes a long way towards giving you a nice general framework to kind of understand this. And it certainly helped us in our thinking about neural networks. So again, in the neural network setting, we're doing this, this general problem of learning over infinite dictionaries of atoms where our atoms are neurons. So the starting point for thinking about how to do learning with a continuous dictionary of atoms is to think about what's a sparsifying transform. So given an atom, we want to find a linear operator L such that if you apply that linear operator to the atom phi, you get a Dirac delta function. So what are some examples of this that everybody's familiar with? If I have a, an atom which is a sinusoid, then the Fourier transform sparsifies it. If I have an atom that's a little localized wave, then the wavelet transform sparsifies it. And then you could say, well, what if I have a neuron, a ReLU activation function? What kind of operation, linear operator will sparsify that. Well, 
it's not too difficult to see. You just take the derivative twice of that. You take one derivative, you get a step function. You take another derivative, you get a Dirac delta, right? So that's this linear operator that's natural when we're looking at rectified linear units. So um, in multiple dimensions, these ReLU neurons are a type of function that's often referred to as a ridge function because it kind of has this uh, property that it only varies in one direction and it's just constant in all the other directions. Okay, so I'm going to kind of just explain that a little bit with the picture. Everybody's familiar with this, but ridge functions are parameterized by angles and offsets. And so here I'm showing you a top-down look of this two-dimensional ReLU activation function. You can, the angle is basically saying what's its orientation. And then the bias is telling you uh, where it sits in the plane. So the weights of your neuron are telling you the orientation, and then the bias is telling you where it's shifted. So when we want to analyze functions that are of that sort, it's really natural to consider the Radon transform. So the whole idea of the Radon transform is to look at functions from various angles and offsets. That's exactly what it's doing. And so that's kind of the natural uh, uh, sort of operation or uh, operator to start thinking about if we're looking at the multidimensional setting. So here's a two-dimensional ReLU function. Here I'm taking second derivatives, which in 2D or higher means the Laplacian. I'm just taking for each uh, a second derivative in each co coordinate of my coordinate system. That will give me, if, I, if you think about differentiating once, again, you're going to get a step function. Twice you get now just a kind of Dirac line, if you will, right along the activation threshold of this neuron. And now if you then take the Radon transform of that, the result of that differentiation operation, you will get a Dirac impulse in the Radon domain where the location of that Dirac impulse indicates the orientation, the angle theta, and the offset B. And this is something that was kind of first uh, explained by Greg Anji and his collaborators in a really nice paper. The height of that Dirac delta, I should say, is the two norm of the weights of that neuron. So here's the picture. You have a ReLU neuron, you take the Laplacian, you apply the Radon transform and uh, a filtering operation, which is just a high pass filter basically. And what you get is a direct delta in the Radon domain where its location is telling you the orientation and offset of the neuron. And then the height is telling you the magnitude of the weights. So here's a, a, a picture of a, a case with a seven neuron network. So there's seven ReLU neurons here. If you apply the Laplacian, what it's going to do is it's going to annihilate all these piecewise, this piecewise linear surface, right? All the linear portions just get wiped out, and you're just left with the black lines that I'm showing you in the middle picture there. Those are those activation thresholds for the seven neurons. And then if you take the filter Radon transform of that, you get seven Derrick impulses. Again, showing you exactly where those neurons are. Uh, uh, in terms of orientation and offset, and then the heights are the magnitude of the weights. So here's how you then use all this to start defining what is this Bonnach space that we should be thinking about. I'll call it BV2 in the Radon domain. So BV with a subscript R there. And what you're doing is you're taking a function F that's mapping from RD to R. You're taking the Laplacian, then the filtered Radon transform, and uh, you're looking at a norm here, which is a total variation norm in the sense of measures. You could think of it loosely as like the L1 norm uh, of this resulting transformation of the function in the Radon domain. So this is measuring sparsity of derivatives of your function in the Radon domain. And what's cool is that if you then uh, take a ReLU network and try to compute its BV Radon seminorm, what you find is it's exactly the neural network path norm. 
that we talked about before, just the product of the output weight of the kth neuron, absolute value of that, times the two norm of the input weights to the kth neuron. And so uh, what we can prove then using all this is that for it, this is where the representer theorem comes in. If we regularize, if we look at a, a optimization function space, this BV, rod on BV space, we try to minimize our fit to data subject to, or having this regularizer, which is the norm in this rod on BV space, then the solution is a single hidden layer neural network with ReLU neurons. And one of the important kind of things that, that becomes clear here is you also need to have these skip connections. They are sort of in the null space of that operator that was the differentiation operator. So this uh, representation theorem suggests that another reason for why you want to have skip connections in your uh, neural network models. So I'm not going to say too much about how you prove this, but I'll just say that um, based on the looking at this operator, which is a combination of the Laplacian differentiation operation and the Radon transform, then you can show that Green's functions are of this operator are the ReLUs and the null space are linear functions, as I already mentioned. Any function in this BV Radon space then can be expressed in terms of finite measure, such that if you apply uh, this operator to your function F, you get that measure. And then minimizing the total variation of a measure subject to a finite set of linear constraints is what's known as the classic Radon measure recovery problem. And it's known since around you know, 1950 or so that the solution is a sum of Dirac's. And so that gives you that sort of sparsifying part. And then if you apply the pseudo inverse of, a, of this operator to a Dirac, you get a ReLU neuron. And so if you put all these ingredients together, you can prove this representer theorem. Okay, so here's what uh, one of these neural networks would look like then. You would have these input and output layer weights, and then you'd also have this skip connection. That's what I'm showing up at the top there, where I've replicated the input again, feeding into that final summing neuron at the output. Uh, and what happens here is, again, I showed you that this uh, BV Radon uh, norm is equivalent to a path norm. So we can recast our whole optimization as a parametric optimization over uh, the weights of a neural network using the path norm. And that's equivalent also to just again, uh, a weight decay a ridge type norm uh, optimization. And the reason for that is the same as it was in that simple 1D case, because of I can pull the magnitude of the input layer weights out of the ReLU neuron without changing anything. If you just work with that property, you can show the equivalence between optimizing using path norm regularization or optimizing using ridge regularization. Okay, so um, I'm just going to mention uh, that if you kind of focus on, say, like the binary classification setting, then you can also relate sort of how well your learned models will generalize to this Radon BV norm uh, using Rademacher complexity techniques. And so roughly speaking, it's telling us that our generalization bound scales or, or a bound scales with the Radon BV norm of your learned function. So controlling that norm also controls your generalization error. So now I just wanna to move to the last part of the talk here. I wanna talk about deep networks, okay? And again, just to remind you of the notation, Phi will be a ReLU neuron activation, gray are linear activations, and the orange are, are ReLUs, and that's going to show up again here, this part. Okay, so if, the first thing we have to think about if we want to handle multi-layer networks is to think about extending what we've already talked about to multi-dimensional outputs. And so you could think of, I have a function F that maps from, say, some input dimension D1 to an output dimension D out, and I can just think of that as D out separate functions, F1 through F sub D out. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, well, let's think about a multidimensional mapping F. And then let's require that each of these output functions is in one of these Radon BV spaces. Okay, so that's my notation for it there. And basically, we're just taking this product space and we're going to let BV2 Radon domain from dimension D in to dimension D out is just a product of 
uh, a, a number of these uh, BV radon spaces, D out of them, one for each of the component functions. If we do this, kind of following similar approaches to what I described before, you can also show that if you regularize a data fitting problem with this now multidimensional version of this BV radon norm, uh, then the solution is a single hidden layer ReLU network. Uh, but with multiple outputs. So again, we get the same thing. We, we have some bound on how many neurons will suffice. And we also see again, the necessity of having skip connections, I'm not showing them in this picture, but they also show up here. So now we have one component that we need. Now we can go from multiple inputs to multiple outputs. And now to think about deep networks, we're going to define compositional versions of these radon BV spaces, where now I'm going to let my overall function be a composition of F1, F2, all the way up to FL for L layers. Each of those component functions is in one of these multidimensional BV radon spaces, where D sub L minus one and D sub L are the sort of input and output dimensions of each layer. Uh, and then we also have a multi-layer representative theorem, which has the same form, the representation a solution to this optimization will be a multi-layer ReLU neural network. I'll kind of show you what it looks like in a two-layer example. So here in this two-layer example, the setup is that we have a four-dimensional input dimension. We said that we want to have one layer with five units and then a final output layer with just one unit. And so what the overall architecture then looks like is something like this, where you can see uh, we have two layers of ReLU neurons. These layers could be, you can make them as wide as you want, so you can really be as over-parameterized as you like, but the specification of the actual dimensions of each layer sort of shows up in this internal linear summing layer. And so that's just kind of the, the nature of that representation theorem. It gives you a neural network that's a little different than a standard just multi-layer ReLU neural network in that you have these sort of internal linear summing nodes that tend to be narrower than uh, the ReLU nodes, which can be uh, ReLU layers, which could be arbitrarily wide. So um, here again, we can show that this deep version of this Radon BV regularization is equivalent to weight decay. There's a couple of different, different forms of it. I'll just mention it quickly. The, the idea here is that the Ws are going to be weights from uh, linear nodes into the ReLU nodes, and the Vs are going to denote weights from uh, orange ReLU nodes into linear nodes here, so kind of input-output weights of each layer. And then you have a, a kind of like uh, two-norm type regularization uh, of one of two forms that I'm showing you below. I'm not going to go into the differences, but both of them basically correspond to this deep Radon BV type regularization. So let me kind of just wrap up with a couple of thoughts about what this tells us about everything, connecting to maybe other things that were discussed earlier today. So first of all, spatial adaptivity in neural tangent kernels, neural tangent kernel being a very popular idea in the theory community. Um, as we've heard before, neural networks are not kernels. That's definitely true. Uh, and and uh, here's another reason why you might want to avoid uh, using kernel methods is because they they can't adapt locally to varying smoothness. And that's an important feature that, that has been very uh, useful in practice in many other applications. And so it's probably important in, in other machine learning settings as well. So, I mean, I guess my take on the neural tangent kernel is at best, it's a, a kind of limiting perspective. It doesn't really tell us the full story. And at worst, it might actually be a little bit misleading about what neural networks are actually doing. Then another super popular idea that I've been hearing a lot about is the lottery ticket hypothesis. Here's what that means. It says that a randomly initialized dense neural network contains a subnetwork that is initialized such that when trained in isolation, it can match the test accuracy of the original network after training for at most the same number of iterations. So this was, I guess, the best paper at iClear a year or two ago, uh, and a lot of people are very interested in it because what it suggests is this idea of uh, 
taking a very, very large randomly initialized neural network and pruning it back. And that's a lot like what you could imagine just taking that infinite dictionary of Raylan, Raylu neurons and then doing some sort of thresholding type of procedure like we were talking about in wavelet thresholding. So there are, I think, some interesting connections between those theories. And again, why would this lottery ticket be plausible? Well, I've already showed you that this neural network representer theorem indicates that sparse solutions exist and they actually naturally arise with weight decay. So here are the takeaway messages, and then I'll wrap up and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, ReLU neural networks are the optimal solutions to learning in these uh, BV Radon spaces. We have a representer theorem. Uh, this perspective provides a novel rationale for why you should use skip connections in your neural networks. Uh, Radon BV regularization is equivalent to weight decay, naturally induces weight sparsity. The deep Radon BV framework suggests possible new architectures that actually sort of incorporate low rank matrices. That is why we had that kind of bottleneck structure there. It turns out that that kind of seems natural and, and people have observed low rank weight matrices appearing just in training uh, it, experimentally. So there's maybe some connections there. And then finally, neural networks are spatially adaptive learners, which is crucial and kernel methods are not. And so, um, I don't know of any way to think about a, a neural network in a Hilbert space. I think it's important to think about them in some non-Hilbert space, and these BV spaces seem to be especially appropriate. So I'll stop there and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, that was a that was a fantastic talk. Uh, sure. Looks like we have two participants raising their hands. Okay. Um, uh, do I do something? To no, I, I, I'm I going to allow them to talk. Yeah. I think this was Fabrice Clairot. Okay. I'm, uh, Fabrice, did you have a question? Or maybe this was older and I, I missed it. Did anyone else have any other questions? If so, feel free to uh, raise your hand. I see Hamid had one in the Q&A. Maybe I'll read it and see if I can answer it. Oh yes, uh, yeah. I can I can read that out. Uh, it says, thanks for the great talk. Can this framework be used to explain the behavior of different architectures and why some are better in some applications? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that's to be explored. I mean, a lot of our work has focused on just the simple uh, single uh, ReLU layer, the shallow networks. And this newer work on the deep stuff is, is really, we're just kind of wrapping it up. We'll be posting the paper very soon. And if anybody's interested, you can just reach out to me and I'll, I'll let you know about it. Um, so we haven't really explored it too much. I will say that uh, one thing I didn't mention throughout all of this is the fact that I've been focusing on ReLU neurons, but this kind of general approach of saying, okay, well, what do I want to do? I want to find a linear operator that sparsifies my activation function. You can do the same thing with other types of activation functions. So in particular, one of the, the approaches that sort of works out most cleanly with all this is to look at other truncated powers. So instead of rectified linear, you could look at rectified quadratic or cubic, et cetera. And these actually coincide in the one-dimensional case to higher order splines. So not piecewise linear splines, but piecewise uh, polynomial splines. And they have a lot of nice properties. So you can extend things that way. So I guess I'm not really answering him each good question. I'd say we understand a bit about how you can extend things to consider what are the trade-offs between using different types of activation functions, but not yet uh, have we really studied what implications this has for different architectures, except for the fact that skip connections, you know, seem to be very important in this, this way of looking at things. Uh, Partha has- Thank you, Rob. 
Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I was. I. I think your. I think actually your answer was related to some of Parth's questions, like because it says, ah, do you yeah, have any ahead. insights into other nonlinearities? Do we need yeah. to uh, generalize the Laplacian or radon transform? Yeah. So the the radon transform part will say the same, but what you'll be looking at is sort of uh, a higher order uh, derivatives. So, okay. So again, the 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 easiest ones and the ones where everything works out just as how I explained for the Relu cases with rectified uh, power functions or truncated power functions. And that will give you higher order splines, uh, ability to uh, capitalize on even more smoothness in the functions you're trying to learn. And there the, you'll change the Laplacian so that you're taking higher order derivatives, but then everything else stays the same. Great, uh, thank you, Rob. I think there are a couple of other questions which I'm also, I'm also happy to read up, read about. So Tammy Kolda has a question about the importance of skip connections. Um, we don't hear about this so much in practice, but uh, your talk stresses that importance a lot. Yeah, I mean, they're important in that, you know, um, if we take these function spaces as the spaces in which we really want to be learning. So we're trying to learn a function. A neural network is representing some sort of functional mapping. And so if we work in these spaces, um, we can naturally kind of connect the semi-norm that I talked about, which involves uh, uh, the Laplacian and the Radon transform and that sort of business. And what that'll do is it actually wipes out part of what could be in your function, which is the, the purely linear portion of a function, just because you're differentiating things. And so to make those spaces sort of complete, you need to include that extra component that's lost by this norm. Uh, and that is the, the skip connection component. And that also generalizes to these other sorts of activation functions where then the missing component will be a, a, a lower order polynomial, depending on whatever uh, truncated power function you're working with. So uh, there are sort of generalized notions of skip connections that come up there. Um, you know, whether, you know, I think they become even more important in the multi-layer setting, just practically and theoretically, um, because it becomes harder and harder to just replicate kind of a linear function as you pass through this uh, neural network. So again, the usual idea of skip connections is you don't wanna force your neural network to have to learn something very simple like the linear a linear mapping or an identity mapping. And so that it's sort of the same idea here, I guess, but coming at it as a natural byproduct of this function space approach and perspective. So thanks, Tammy, for the question. I'm not sure I answered it completely, but uh, yeah, we didn't, we didn't say, oh yeah, we want to have an architecture with skip connections. It just naturally comes out of the, the variational approach. So I think we have one other, we have a question from an, an anonymous uh, attendee. Um, and uh -huh. the question is, why are wavelet transforms not as good as approximating local smoothness? My thought was that it was even their advantages over Fourier transforms. Uh, so, so wavelet transforms, sorry, uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding the question, but they are locally adaptive. Because you can basically, you know, again, like imagine that that function I showed. I think, it, whoops, I think I even have it. You know, let me kind of. Oh, and I, I should say here at the end, I have a bunch of, yeah. So like, let's look at this function that we were considering before. Uh, you can use uh, wavelets at a fine scale to represent the variations in the fastly varying portion of this signal, and you can then use wavelets at a very uh, low resolution to represent this. So wavelets can be, are great at adapting to local smoothness. So I, I'm not sure if I, that was, didn't come across. And the problem with the Fourier transform is the atoms are global, right? You, you could use one low frequency sinusoid, and that would be good in the, the, the low frequency portions, but then it, it's totally mismatched to where it starts varying more quickly. And there's just no way to uh, spatially localized these different types of variations with Fourier atoms. You need localized basis functions. Uh, and ReLUs also do that because they are localized by nature because they uh, turn, they, they're off and then they turn on and you can decide where they turn on. Does that help answer that anonymous question? Yeah, 
sorry if I didn't, oh, I think I see a, maybe a thumbs up. I don't, I don't know. Okay, I hope it did. I think it was it? useful for me. Um, okay. But, uh, so yeah, uh, so, so definitely I'm... wavelets are in low dimensions, one dimension, two dimensions, wavelets are, are great. I don't know why you would, you know, use a neural network uh, in those situations, but uh, those really don't generalize to, to higher and higher dimensions. And then of course, there's probably a lot of things you can do with multi-layer neural networks that uh, aren't, aren't, and that's still not understood. We don't really even have a great sense of what these compositional BV radon spaces are, how they relate to other commonly known classical function spaces. So there's tons of avenues for, for future work along, along those lines. So we have a couple more questions and sure. I think I think then we will have to wrap up after that because we're getting yeah. close to the hour. Uh, from, okay, so from, I'm not gonna pronounce, I'm not sure I'm gonna pronounce the name right, but from Guillaume Wang, does the representation theorem also hold in classification settings for the losses of the form of the uh, zero one yeah. loss rather than the square, square distance? If yes, what are the differences? If not, can you briefly explain how you manage to bound Lattermacher complexity? Yeah, so definitely in the representer theorem, and, and I, I could back up, but it, it's for any lower semi-continuous loss function. So that includes things like hinge loss, logistic loss, uh, and, and so forth. And, and um, yeah, so there's, there's no problem there. Um, and when we did look at the Rademacher complexity, we were definitely looking at uh, or thinking about losses that are uh, Lipschitz loss functions, or at least Lipschitz over the uh, uh, range of uh, the data. So I think that answers Guillaume's question. And uh, we, great. We have one last question from Mario. Uh, which says, when you related the lottery ticket hypothesis with the sparse ReLU network, uh, you didn't mention the retraining phase of the sparsified network. Would that correspond to a debiasing phase? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a that's a super interesting question from Mario. I hadn't thought of it that way, but possibly. Um, I think you notice, and maybe I'll, let me back up here. Sorry, I have to back up my slide if I can do that. Uh, well, where did I have it shoot? Um, you, yeah, I think you might have noticed that there appeared to be a little bit of shrinking effect. Uh, it, the, the fastly oscillating part of our solution was just undershooting a little bit the training points. And so that's a common thing you would see with L1 regularization. And so in the context of the lottery ticket hypothesis, you know, the key idea is that they uh, prune the neural network and then they go back to that prune neural network with the exact same initialization of those weights of the remaining edges in the network and then retrain. And so there's something very important about that initialization and then retraining. And then perhaps if you then retrain that sparse one uh, without any kind of regularization at all, then, then maybe you would be doing some sort of deep biasing. I haven't thought about that, but, but possibly. And I'll just also mention that that's sort of the original lottery ticket hypothesis. Now people are really interested in what they sometimes call the strong lottery ticket hypothesis, which really doesn't have anything to do with the retraining. It just says take a massive randomly initialized neural network and then just do some sort of pruning uh, to try to find a good subnetwork that, that gener generates the function you're, you're, you're hoping to find uh, just through pruning. And that is very, very much in the spirit of nonlinear approximation theory. That's the basis of wavelet methods and wavelet thresholding. So I think that's a cool, cool idea. And I'd like to think about that more too. Great. Um, thank you very much again, Bob. Uh, I had questions too, but I'll follow up offline. <laughs> yeah, and I, I didn't show this, but there I do have a bunch of uh, the main papers that I referenced that I, I, I would recommend if anybody's interested in any of this is sort of, you can see it spans from 1970 with Grace's great work all the way up to uh, 2021, where a lot of recent uh, interesting work has happened uh, from uh, several groups. So I'll leave it there. Great, uh, thank you very much again, Bob, for the really fantastic talk. Sure. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And thanks for the great questions.